And we're going to be talking about applications. And when we solve these, you might get more than one answer. So you can sometimes have more than one answer. Okay, so sometimes on these, you might have a question where you can have more than one answer. In many cases, you can't. Now, there's certain things that we have to remember. These are applications. So there's cer cer certain things that we have to remember. Distance, time, rate of speed, all of those can't be negative. So distance can't be negative. Time can't be negative. Um, perimeter, these can't be negative. So when we, when we work something out, we need to make sure if we get multiple answers, that they work. Because in some cases, we might be solving something and we might get two times. We might get a time of 10 seconds and a time of minus 5 seconds. Now, only one of those is going to work, right? Because can time ever be negative? No. Now, you may get an answer of a negative time and you would just disregard that one. So if you got, let's say, 10 seconds and a negative 5 seconds, you would just get rid of the negative 5 seconds and you'd only be left with the 10. So when we work these out, we have to remember that like, things like the perimeter, the time, the distance, anything you can measure cannot be negative. So if it comes out to be negative, you just get rid of it. And you only have a positive solution. In other cases, it might be you're solving for an integer. If you're solving for consecutive integers, you can have negative integers. So those would be okay. So you really have to be careful when you solve these, when you get the answer, to see if the answer makes sense. In many cases, only one of them will. The other one won't. So you have to be very, very careful when you actually work these out. I'm going to pick some from our textbook. Now, these may require you to factor they may require you to use the quadratic formula in a few cases or zero factor. Most common is going to be zero factor and the square root property. So we're in 1, 5, and I'm going to pick some of these from our textbook to look at. We'll do one or two of each type just to make sure that we know how to solve these. So we'll start with consecutive integers. And we'll look on page 147, uh, we'll look at question 12. So page 147, we're going to look at question 12. And these are actually the easiest to solve. So question 12. We want to find two consecutive even integers whose product is 224. So 224. Now, what do we know about product? Product means what? Multiply. When we talk about consecutive integers, there are consecutive integers and there are consecutive even or odd. So if it is just consecutive integers, They have a gap of 1. So if it is just consecutive integers, that means the first number is x, second number is x plus 1, third number, right, would be x plus 2, you add 1. What about even or odd? Okay, well when I talk about even or odd, I'm going to be adding 2. So when I talk about consecutive even or odd integers, we call the first number x. The second one is going to be x plus 2. The third one 
would be x plus 4. What are you doing each time? You're adding 2. You probably covered these in your intermediate algebra course from before. Okay. So who still needs that homework packet? Who came in late and needs the homework packet? Yeah. Everybody else has got one. So what we're going to be looking at here is consecutive integers. And remember, if it's even or odd, you add 2. If it's just plain consecutive integers, then you add 1. So when we read question 12, it's talking about the product. And in your intermediate algebra course, you only dealt with addition and subtraction of these and sums. In this one, though, we're going to be looking at the product. So question 12 says, find two consecutive, key word here, even integers whose product is 224. So first off, what do we know about the integers? Even. So what's the gap going to be? Two. So we need two of them. So we're going to call the first one x, and the second one is going to be x plus what? And what do we know? We know the first number times the second number has to give you 224 because that's the product. These are very, very simple to work through actually. So these multiply together to give you now that 224. We're going to have to FOIL, set it to zero and factor. So plug in our information. We know that the first one is x, and we know the second one is x plus 2. And that equals 224. And how do we finish this out? Now, these are going to be quadratics. So we distribute that x through first. And that is now x squared plus 2x equals... 224, and we should know what to do. How would we approach this question? What would we need to do to solve it? We would set it equal to what? Zero, right? Okay. Remember, we did these. We did these on our exam. We did a lot of them. Set it to zero, and then you can either factor or you can use the quadratic formula. These should factor out nicely, though. So if we're going to factor this, first times the last. First times the last, remember there's a 1 here. First times the last is a minus 224. And let's review our signs again. It's a minus 224. How can we multiply together to give you a negative number? Are they the same signs or are they different? They would be what? Different. Okay, this is basically a review of what we did before. Which one's larger? Positive, because it's in the middle, right? So positive and negative. Now, where do we begin? Because 224 is a pretty big number. Well, it's an even number. Right, ends in a 4, so it's an even number. Um, you could start wherever. I would probably start with, let's say, uh, let's try 12. I think 12 might work. Okay, if I use 12, 12 doesn't go in there, right? Um, what about 8? Does 8 work? 8 and 28, but that's a difference of 10, and what do we need? We need a difference of 2. So let's try 14, and we'll just keep going until we find it. 14 and 16, does that work for us? Yes, because we need a difference of what? 2. So we need a positive 16 and a negative what? 14. Now, the good thing about these is we can jump directly to our factors. So we have x plus 16, okay? and x minus 14 equals 0. And we've done these before. So x plus 16 equals 0. 
So x equals a negative 16. x minus 14 equals 0. So x equals then a what? Positive 14. Now, when we work out these applications, we have to make sure that we get our answers. These are not the actual answers. They're part of it. But when we get the answers, we're going to have pairs. So we want two numbers of each. So let's start with the 14. If my first number is 14 and I add 2 to it, what's the next even number? If I add 2 to it, right? First one's 14. Second one is going to be what? 16. So there's two of them. Now there's also a negative set. And what's my negative set going to be? Minus 16. And if I add 2 to minus 16, I get a what? Minus 14. So you're actually going to get four answers total, two sets. A positive set and a negative set. Why does that work? So what's 14 times 16? So 14 times 16, that's 224, right? But what about this one? What about minus 16 times a minus 14? Well, what does that also give you? 224, right? So you see how you get a positive set and a negative set. So two numbers for each set. Is everyone okay with how we did that, right? So two numbers, so you're going to get four total, a positive set and a negative set. Let's look at one more. Uh, how about question 18? So the difference of squares of two positive, and that's very important there, positive consecutive odd integers is 32. We need to find the integers. So the first thing that we look at is what do we have? How many numbers? Two numbers, okay? And what are they? In this case, they are odd. So we need two numbers. These are going to be odd. So what's my gap going to be? One or two? If we're even or odd, we have a gap of what? Two, right? Regular consecutive integers, they only have a gap of one. So these are going to have a gap of two. So you're looking at question 18, and we need two numbers. So the first number is going to be x, because these are odd numbers, so the gap of 2. Second number is going to be x plus 1, 2. Now, when we work these out, we need to make sure we get them in the correct order and work with it. So it says the difference of the squares of two positive consecutive odd integers is 32. Now we have to make sure that the larger number always goes first. And which one is the larger number? If I add 2 to it, this one's going to be the larger number. Now we want the difference of squares. So that's going to be the second number, it's the larger one, squared, minus the first number, squared, and that's going to be a difference of what? 32. Now, why does the larger number always have to go first? Because when I subtract them, that makes it positive, right? Positive 32. If you think about it like this, which number is larger? If I give you two numbers, how about, um, how about 9 and 11? Okay, well we know that 11 is the second number, it's larger. 11 minus 9 is what? 2. But if I mix up the order, what does it give you? 9 minus 11 would be a negative 2. So we need to make sure that the larger number, which is the second one, goes first. Now we're going to have to build our equation. So plug in our information. So the second number, well that is x plus 2 quantity squared minus the first number, which is x squared, and that equals r32. Now 
Now, these require a lot of algebra. So we have to work with this. We have to consolidate it down as much as we can. That might mean foiling, factoring, anything we can do to make it easier. So we've got to work with this x plus 2 quantity squared. Well, that is x plus 2 and x plus 2. So let's go ahead now and foil this out. Take your time with these. This is one of the hardest sections. And this course is this one. So we're going to foil it out. So that's going to be x squared, right? And we foil first times first. Outside and outside. So that's 2x. Inside and inside. That's 2x. And last and last is a 4. So that is then x squared plus 4x plus 4. Here's where students sometimes try to make it more difficult than what it really needs to be. What's going to happen with these x squareds? Okay, The x squareds are going to cancel. And that leaves you with 4x plus 4 equals 32. Here's where students make a mistake. Do I need to set this one equal to 0? No, why not? Because are there any squares or any cubes or any powers? No. How do I solve it? Don't overcomplicate it. All I need to do is what? Move that 4 over, right? So don't try to set it to 0. You don't need to do that because this is linear. Remember the difference between linear and nonlinear? This is linear because there's no power, so just move that 4 over. So then we have 4x equals 28. We'll divide by our 4, and that gives me x equals now what? 7. What are my two answers now? My two answers would be 7, and what's the next odd number? When you add 2 to that 7, okay, first number 7, second number is going to be what? 9. There's my answer. Now, why do I not have any negative numbers? Well, it tells you specifically in the question, it tells you what? Okay. It tells you find the difference of squares of two positive consecutive integers. So they won't have any negatives because they're positive. That's why the larger one goes first. So we found that. Now, why does it work? How can we check? If I wanted to check, let's see if it works. 9 squared minus 7 squared should equal 32. Well, what's 9 squared? 9 squared is 81. 7 squared is 49. When I subtract them, I get 32 equals what now? 32, right? Okay. You should be able to check these pretty easily if you want to. Now square them and subtract them. What should they give you? should give you that 32. They do. So this is the answer right here. In some cases, you'll get two sets of numbers. In this case, we just get one set. And these are difficult in two ways. They're difficult sometimes in the setup, and then they're also difficult when you go to solve them, because you may have to factor, use the square root property, and there's a variety of different things you may have to use, different techniques. Let's look now at a geometric figure. Let's look at question 26. And this is on page 148. So we're going to look at question 26 here. We're going to read it. We're, we're going to have to draw a diagram for this one. And then we're going to have to work it out and answer the question. 
So a landscape architect has included a rectangular flower bed measuring nine feet by five feet in the plans for a new building. She wants to use two colors of flowers in that flower bed, one in the center and the other for a border, and the same width on all four sides. If she has enough plants to cover, 24 square feet for the border. How wide can the border be? So first thing we need to figure out is what we're looking at. So we need to think about what we've got. So when we read this, it says, first, we've got a nine by five flower bed. So this is on page 148. We're looking here at question 26. So we have a nine by five foot flower bed. So we'll go ahead and draw this out. And in this flower bed, we've got it to do it in two colors. So we want a different color in the center. So there's the center. And we need a different color on the outside. Okay, so that's what we want. Okay, we want a center and we want a border around that center. And we know that this entire flower bed is 9 by 5 feet. So it's 9 by 5. Where do we begin? Well, we, we first drew a picture. Now, what can we do from this picture? Can I find the total area of this rectangle? Can someone tell me how we find the total area of the rectangle? Length times width. Okay, what would that be? Let's talk about that piece. What's the total area of the entire flower bed? It's 5 by 9, so that would be what? 45, right? Okay, 9 times 5, or sorry, yeah, 9 times 5, that gives you that 45, and that square feet, that's my total area. Okay. Now, what else do I know? I know I need to make a border. And that border has to be the same all the way around. So that border needs to be the same all the way around. Okay, so X is going to be the border. So let's look at the center. Let's take out that center and let's redraw that center. If I redraw that center, we're going to have to redimension it. So this is where we have to kind of think about things a little bit here. So if I take out that center, I am going to have to redimension it on its own. So what, what is that going to look like? If I just take out that green center, just the center, what is the dimension going to be? Well, first off, the entire dimension here is what? This entire length is 9, right? Now how much is gone for each side? There, if we've got the 9, this is the original piece. How much is gone? X and X. So this would be, when I dimension it out, 9 minus what? 2X, right? Because there's a 9 for my total. X is gone on each side. That's that border. Now, what about the width here? Well, it's 5 again. And how much is gone from the top and the bottom? X from each one. So that's going to be 5 minus what? 2x. So let's find the area of the center. And the area of the center would be 5 minus 2x. 
times 9 minus 2x. I know these are complicated questions. They take a little bit of thinking. So the first thing I did was I got my total area, and then I took out the center. Now this is a puzzle, so we're going to do it in small pieces. So I took the center out, okay, and I'm going to go ahead and foil this out. So if I foil this out, what would this be? We're going to foil it here. If I foil, it's 9 times 5, that's a 45. We've got 5 times a negative 2x, that's a minus 10x. We've got minus 2 times 9, that's a minus 18x. Watch your signs. Minus 2 times minus 2, that makes it a positive 4x squared. So that is then 4x squared. Combining like terms, minus 28x plus 45. We're going to put all the pieces together here in a moment. Now, from the question, if I read this question, what does it tell you about the border? She has enough plants to cover what? 24 square feet for the border. So we're going to write that down as well. And then we're going to think about how all these pieces go together. So the border area is 24. Okay, so let's think about what we've got. If this is a puzzle, the sum of the parts gives you the whole, right? So if I think about this in terms of pieces, if I put all the pieces back together, they should give me that 45, because that's my total. So how are we going to come up with an equation and give us something that we can solve? Well, we have to think about what we've got and how it goes together. So we know some of the pieces gives you the whole. So I know the total area. Now we'll just say that these two add that the border and the center add together to give you that 45. So the center, we have to build our equation plus the border equals the total area. Okay. Now, what did we find to be the center? What was the area of the center? Okay, the area of the center, well, that was the 4x squared minus 28x plus 45, right? Then what did we find to be the border? What does it tell you the border area is? 24. And what is my total area now? Do you remember? We did the total area at the very beginning, and what was my total area? 45. It's just, a, it's just a puzzle. It's all the pieces go together to give you that 45. So now we have an equation that we can finally solve. So now we're going to set this to zero and solve it. So we're going to combine like terms. So I'm going to move that 45 over. And that leaves you with a 4x squared minus 28x plus 24 equals 0. Okay, so we'll put all the pieces together. Whenever you look at a question like this, I'm going to factor, right? It's set to 0. Always, always, before you start multiplying, check to see if they have a number in common. Is there a number in common with the 4, 28, and 24? Yep, larger than that, though, do they all have a 4 in common? Always take out the largest number possible. So these all have a 4 in common. So that means that I can divide everything now by a 4. And then I won't have to factor by grouping, because then I'll just be able to factor it and jump directly to my answers. So the 4s cancel, and that leaves you with an x squared. Uh, 28 divided by 4, it's a negative. So 28 divided by 4, that makes it a negative 7x there. Uh, 24 divided by 4, well, that's a 6. And we're in luck because this one is very easy to factor. So there's not much to do on this one. 
First times the last. Okay. One times six, that's a six. What do we know about the signs? Are they different or are they the same? Are they different or are they the same? Six is positive. So what do we know about the signs? Different or are they the same? Okay, which one? Let's remember we, we, we took a test over these last, last time. Yep. These, this is a positive. How can you get two numbers to give you positive? They're either both positive or both what? Negative. So they have to be the same. You have to know how to factor to solve these out. What's the sign in the middle? Negative. What two numbers multiply together to give you 6, add together to give you 7? 6 and 1, right? Because 6 and 1 adds together to give you what? 7. Now we're going to jump to our factors here. And we've got x minus 6, x minus 1 equals 0. So x minus 6 equals 0. So one possible solution is x equals 6. x minus 1 equals 0. So one possible solution is 1. Now, we need to figure out which one of these is going to work. There's only one of them that's actually a legitimate answer. We've got two of them to choose from, but one of these is not going to make sense. So I'm going to redraw that original, and we'll see which one of these doesn't make sense. So there's the border here. Remember, x represents that border. Okay, which one of these doesn't make sense? I'm going to say that the 6 doesn't make sense. Why do you think the 6 doesn't make sense? It has to fit inside this box, right? This box is 5 by what? 9. If my border was 6, would it even fit inside of here? No. Right, because x is that little border. If I try to put the 6 in here, I get 6 and 6. That makes it 12, and it can't fit in that 5 by 9 box, can it? So x equals 6 does not work because it's too big to fit in the box. But what about the 1? Does 1 work? Yeah, because you can have a border one foot all the way around. And if it's 1, that would fit in here because 1 and 1 makes it 2. It's definitely less than 5. 1 and 1 is 2. Definitely less than 9. So what do we know our answer is going to be? Well, the answer is that border. Okay, And we need to make sure that we label it so that border is measured in feet, so that border is one foot one. And I know these questions are complicated with the setup and also with the solving. I think this is probably the most difficult section in our textbook. This is why I split up the first chapter into two parts, because it just takes too much time to go through some of these. And I, I think it's too much material, so that's why I split it up. Let's look at another one. They're all a little bit different. They require a lot of techniques to solve and also set up. Let's look at, um, how about 31? 31 is an easier one. Okay, 31 is going to be one that we, we, we may have to think about it a little bit. But we can solve 31 pretty easily. Okay, dimensions of a square. What is the length of the side of a square if its area and its perimeter are numerically equal? Okay, so one important thing that we have to remember is the fact that this comes from a square, right? And this was on page 149, and that was question 31. So 
Page 149, question 31. Now, we need to think about a square. And what's different about a square than a rectangle? What separates a square from a rectangle? Okay. In a square, all sides are the same. Now, let's go ahead and find out the area and the perimeter of this square. So what would the area of this square be? It's a square. Area is length times width, so that would be x times x, which is then what? Squared, so that's my area. Now, what about the perimeter? What does it mean if I ask you to find the perimeter? What do I do to find the perimeter? I add up all the sides, right? So if I add up all the sides, what's my perimeter going to be? If I add them all up, that's going to be 4x, right? So this is actually a little bit easier than the last one. When you think about perimeter and the area. Now, this is important. It's a square, okay? It wouldn't work with a rectangle. It only works with a square. Because in the square, all the sides are the same. So the area is x squared. Perimeter is 4x. Now, what does our equation look like? Well, it says in that, in that problem that the area is numerically equal to the perimeter. So the area must equal the perimeter. Okay, so now we know the area. Well, what's the area of that square? x squared. And what's the perimeter of that square? 4x, right? Now we can solve it. We are going to get two solutions, but only one of them is really going to make sense. So if we want to solve this, we have a square. So anytime we have a square, we have to set it equal to 0. So move that 4x over. And we're going to solve this one again by factoring. So what can I factor out of this? What's in common? Okay, someone said it. I can factor out an x, right? And that would then leave you with an x minus 4 equals 0. Never divide by the variable x. If you divide by the variable x, we'll lose a solution. So anytime it's x squared or x cubed, it has to go to zero so you can factor it. So what are my two possible solutions? Well, the first one comes from right here because that's x equals zero. What about the other one? Well, it's x minus four equals zero. So x equals now what? Four. Okay, we have two possible solutions, zero and four. What is that x? Okay. x is the length of the side of the square, right? Does it make sense to have a length of the square to be 0? No. So what's the only one that's going to make sense here? The 4. So the only solution that we have is going to be x equals what? 4. Okay. The other one just doesn't make sense for our question. Try another one. They're all similar, but a little bit different. Okay, let's try another one. Let's look at how about um, how about question thirty-two? Let's look at a rectangle. Re dimensions of a rectangle. A rectangle has an area that is numerically, that means they're going to equal, twice its perimeter. So the area equals twice the perimeter. If its length is twice the width, what are the dimensions? So first off, we're, we'll begin by drawing our rectangle. It's not a square anymore, it's a rectangle. So we've got to be very careful. 
when we work with these geometric figures. So here's our rectangle. And what do we know about the length and the width? We'll just get our dimensions first. It says the length is twice the width. So if the length is twice the width, we'll just call that that width, then that's going to be easy. We'll call that width x. So the length is going to be 2x. So it's going to be 2x by x. Is everyone okay with how I got that? Right? Length is twice the width. Call the width x. Length is 2x. What would the area of this rectangle be? Again, it's length times width. So that's x times that 2x. So that comes out to be 2x squared. What about the perimeter? Because we need that as well. Perimeter, we add up all the sides. So we've got x plus 2x plus x plus 2x. So we add them all together. And it looks like we now have 6x. So when we come up to a geometric figure like this, what's the first thing we do? Find the area and the perimeter. Okay. Then we need to see how they go together. Now, in the last question, when we talked about the square, we said that they were the same, right? Okay, what about this one? If we read this one, what does it say? I'll put it, the dimensions up, or the problem up here. It says the area, that is numerically twice its perimeter, right? Numerically twice the perimeter. So let's write up our equation now. Fill in the pieces. So the area equal to twice the perimeter. Now, we already worked this out a moment ago. We know the area, well, that was 2x squared. What about the perimeter? The perimeter was 6x. We've got two of those. So that's 2 times that 6x there. We should be able to solve it. So we've got 2x squared equals uh, 2 times 6 makes it 12x. We have an x squared, so what do we need to do? Set this equal to what? Set it equal to 0. So now we've got 2x squared minus 12x equals 0. How would I solve this? Now, you don't want to divide by that variable x, but there is a number that's in common. I have a 2 and I have a 12. So what number's in common? 2. So divide it all by 2. That makes it smaller and easier to deal with. So divide everything here by a 2. And that leaves you then with x squared minus 6x equals 0. What can I factor out of here? What comes out of it? Can someone tell me? Yep, an x can come out. And that's going to leave you with an x minus 6 equals 0. And we get two solutions, two possible solutions. So one of them is x equals 0. And the other one is x minus 6 equals 0. So x equals 6. Now, just like the last one, which one of these would not make sense for it to be a length or a width. Zero. So that's gone. Now we do need to find the length and the width of this rectangle. Remember what they were. Well, the length was 2x. And the width was x. So what do we know about the length? Okay, the length is going to be 2x. So that's 2 times 6 so my width, or sorry, my length would be what? 12. We don't have any units because it doesn't say. What about the width? Okay, the width is just x, bless you. So that means that part is going to be what? Just simply 6.
Next, we're going to look at the Pythagorean theorem. And the Pythagorean theorem works for right triangles. So the Pythagorean theorem says this. Pythagorean theorem says if you have a right triangle, then a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And c is the diagonal. So make sure that c is going to be that diagonal. The others don't matter. It's just that C always has to be on the diagonal. Okay, so we're now going to be using this to come up with equations, solve them, and then again, see if our solutions make sense. So let's look at question 40. This is on page 150. Question 40. And this one's actually a little bit easier than some of the others. So we're going to read it. And then we'll come up with our equation. Now this one's going to make a triangle. So Tanner and Sheldon have purchased communications receivers. If they leave from the same point at the same time, Tanner walking north at two and a half miles an hour, and Sheldon walking east at three miles an hour, how long will they be able to talk to each other? The range of the communications receivers is four miles. And we want to round our answer to the nearest minute. So whatever we get, we have to make sure it's in terms of minutes. So we need to come up with a triangle. What do we know about these individuals? It says they leave at the same time. Tanner walks north. Sheldon walks Um, east. So north and east. And this is Tanner up here going to the north. And this is Sheldon over here. And we need to figure out how they relate to each other. And we're working with the distance. So we know whenever we talk about a distance, we have a rate. And we have a time. Okay, so how fast is Tanner traveling? Okay, we read it. It says Tanner starts traveling north at two and a half miles an hour. So that's 2.5. And what about Sheldon? Okay, if we read it here, it says Sheldon begins walking to the east at three miles an hour. So his rate is three. Do we know the times? No, that's unknown. What about the distance for each one? Okay, we, we need to find our distance here. And how do we find our distance? Distance is rate times what? Time. So this one would be 2.5x. And what about this one over here for its distance for Sheldon? Well, it would be what? 3x, right? Because those go together. And then how far apart are they? This is my distance here. And I want these two to be 4 miles apart. So the miles apart is going to be 4. So that made our triangles. Everyone kind of okay with that. And we're going to do a lot of these. I'm going to set some up from your homework in a moment as well. 
So rate times time gives you that distance. Now we have a triangle, right? Okay, so what do we know about the triangle? We go back and we look at the Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared, right? C is the diagonal. So let's try to build our formula from here. This is going to be our A. This is going to be our B. This right here is the C. So we know that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. And we can now fill this in. So A squared, well that would be 2.5x, and use parentheses, here's where students make a mistake, make sure you use parentheses around it, squared, plus B squared, which is 3x, quantity squared, right, that's your B, and what does it equal? It equals that C squared, which is 4 squared, right? When you work this one out, be very, very careful because you have to square the numbers along with the variable. That square gets distributed through, so each part gets squared. So we'll start with 2.5, right? 2.5 squared. What's 2.5 squared? Well, 2.5 squared, or 2.5 squared, is 6.25. So this piece is going to be 6.25x squared. This one is going to be 3 squared, which is 9x squared. And what about the right-hand side? Well, it's easy because 4 squared is what? 4 squared is 16. Combine them together. And now this one has decimals, so we're going to use decimals. So adding those up, let's see what we've got. we got 9 plus 6.25. That gives you 15.25x squared equals 16. We have covered how to solve these before. What technique are we going to be using? Does anyone have any idea? Let's talk about our choices. Quadratic formula, zero factor, square root property. Which one do you think we'll be using? Okay, someone said it, square root property, right? So we're going to try and apply the square root property. So let's go ahead and do that. Get that x squared by itself. So divide by that 15.25. So let's take that 16, divide it by that 15.25. We'll take it out to, let's say, four decimal places. That way, at the very, very end, we can get it to the nearest minute. So that is 1.049 if we round two. Okay. So I just rounded a bit there. How do we now get rid of that x squared? What do we need to do next? How do we get rid of a square? We do what? Square root. Okay. And whenever we take a square root, we add on a what? Don't forget that. Plus or minus. Now use a calculator. And this will give us our answer. Then to two decimal, or sorry, three decimal places. It'll be three. So we're going to have to take the square root. I'm going to do that second square root key. And we're going to take the square root of 1.0492. And that square root then, three places is enough, is 1.024. Now we do have two answers here. But which one does not make sense, do you think? The negative one, right? Because can you have a negative length or width? No. So we got two of them. This one doesn't work. Now, this is in terms of hours. We want it in minutes.
how do we make this then to the nearest minute? Okay, we want this to the nearest minute. Right now it's in hours. So we take our 1.024 and we've got to multiply that by what? Multiply that by 60. And that's 1.024. We'll multiply that by 60. And that gave you 61.44. We want this to the nearest minute. So it looks like it's going to be about 61 minutes. So they should be able to talk for about 61 minutes before they lose the signal. We've got quite a bit of time left, so I'm going to go through some of your homework questions. Not all of them, but I'm going to go through some of them, and I'm going to set them up for you. You're going to have to solve them, though. So I'm not going to set them all up, but I'll set up a large portion of them. But you're going to have to solve them, okay? I'll, I'll set up about half of them. So let's look at our homework here. Now let's try to figure out the first one. Okay, so we're going to read it. I'm going to get you the equation. You're going to have to solve it. Okay, I'm not going to set them all up, but I'll set a lot of them up. The hard part in, in, on these is not just the setup, it's also solving. Because sometimes they're difficult to solve and they're difficult to set up. But let's look at the first one here. A ladder, and, and let's be quiet so we can read through this, a ladder is resting against a wall. The top of the ladder touches the wall at a height of six feet. Find the length of the ladder. If the length is two feet more than the distance from the wall. So let's think about what we have. We're going to start off with a picture here. And this is your homework. One point five. We're going to look at the first one. So let's try to draw a picture. So this is going to be the wall over here. Okay, and we have a ladder on the wall. So looking at this, what does this look like? This looks like a triangle, doesn't it? I think I can come up with a triangle here. Here's the wall. We've got a ladder on the wall. This is the ladder over here. Now, what do we know about the ladder? It says the ladder is resting against the wall. Top of the ladder touches the wall at a height of six feet. So that tells me that's going to be six feet tall. Okay, so we, a lot of these, you have to think of it as a geometric figure. If it comes out to be a triangle, you're probably going to have to use the Pythagorean theorem. So we're going to try to make a right triangle here. So this ladder is leaning up against the wall. It hits the wall at a height of six feet. Find the length of the ladder. If the length is two feet more than the distance from the wall. So do we know the distance from the wall? No. But what do we know about the ladder? The ladder is what? Two feet more. So the ladder would be x plus what? Two. And that's going to be the ladder. Now, what does this look like? Okay, this looks like a triangle. So what are we going to have to use? We just did it a moment ago. We're going to have to use the Pythagorean theorem. So this is your A. This is your, or sorry, this is your C. Make sure you label the C correctly. This is your diagonal. This is your A and this is your B. It doesn't matter which one's A and B. Just make sure that C is the diagonal. That's the most important part. Okay, so make sure that C is that diagonal. So this part has to be the C. 
doesn't matter which one's A and B. Now, what does our equation look like? The Pythagorean theorem says that A squared plus B squared equals what? C squared, so fill it in. So that is X squared plus 6 squared, you've got to square everything. And what does that equal? Well, that equals X plus 2 quantity squared. And you can finish it from here. So C has to be the diagonal. A and B, it doesn't matter which one is which. Just make sure one of them is A, one of them is B. But C has to be the diagonal. Now you can finish it all out. But X is not going to be your answer because we want to find the length of the ladder, right? So we'll find whatever we find is X. We'll add 2 to that to get the ladder. So we have to find the length of the ladder. Now, you're going to get two solutions, but can we have a negative value for the X? No. Why not? Because it's something you can measure, right? Can you measure a negative length and width? No. So you'll get two solutions possibly for the X. You only want the positive one. So what we did was we made this one into a triangle. And then you can finish it from here. Now let's go back up and look at the second question. We did one of these earlier today. We want to find two consecutive odd integers whose product is 483. So I'll help set this one up. This one's quite a bit easier. There's some that are more difficult than others. So we need two numbers that are odd. Okay, and if it's odd, that means we've got to add what? Two. So the first number is going to be x, and the second number is going to be x plus 2. And we know the first number times the second number is going to give you 483. And so that is then x squared. Okay. Oh, sorry, not x squared. It's, it's x here. And we're going to multiply that by, let me say it right here, x plus 2, and that equals your 483. And you can finish it. Now, while you're working on this one, you're going to get, on, on, on this one, you're going to get four answers total. Okay? You're going to get two positive numbers, right? two consecutive odd numbers that are positive, and you're going to get two consecutive negative numbers. So you're going to get this solved out. You'll get the two numbers, and then you've got to get the pairs. So a pair of positive numbers and a pair of negative numbers. So you should end up with four numbers total and, and two pairs. I'll do another one. I'm not going to work them all out, but I'll just randomly pick some. I'm going to leave three for you to do. You can try to work three on your own, but let's look at four. Let's see how we would set up question four. We kind of did one like this before. Okay, so this one's actually pretty easy. So this is a square. So what's special about a square versus a rectangle? Okay, all sides are going to be the same. So very important that you remember that. When we see square, that means all the sides are the same. And it says the area of a square is numerically 4 less than the perimeter. So that area is going to be the perimeter minus 4. 
this is a square, so all the sides are the same, and what would the area be? Can someone tell me what the area would be? Okay, uh, well that's the perimeter. So the perimeter was adding the sides, so that would be 4x. Now what about the area? Area is length times width, so it would be what? Does anyone know what that would be, the area here? And not 2x, it would be x squared, wouldn't it? Okay. So the perimeter, you add up all the sides, the area is the length times the width. Now when we plug it in, we've got x squared equals 4x, right, minus 4. And you can finish it from here. Okay, so you'll finish it, and you'll get the area, or not the area, but you'll get the length of that square. Okay, uh, five. I'm not going to work out five, but we're going to talk quickly about five. Five is very easy compared to some of the others. Question five. Here's our formula for question five. So it says a, a rock falls from a tower that is 137.2 meters high, and as it's fallen, it's given by this equation. We just, that equation comes from the effects of gravity. Now it says, in how many seconds will it take for the rock to hit the ground? And that means H is zero. So what are we going to look at for my equation? What would my equation be? What are we going to plug in for H here? Okay. So what would the equation look like? Yep, zero equals 137.2 minus 4.9 t squared. And you can finish this. That's it. That's all you have to do. That one would be using the square root property. Now, if you took a physics course, you would learn that this 4.9, that's the effects of gravity. But we don't really discuss it in this course. But that 4.9, that's the effects of gravity. 9.8 meters per second, or, or 4.9 feet per second. What about 6? Well, 6, we've got this equation here. And when they give you an equation, you've got to figure out what goes where. Okay, so the amount of money called the principal is deposited in an account that pays an interest rate R compounded annually. Then in two years, the investment will go to this A. You're given this formula. So on these, what you want to do is you want to look at the formula. And then you want to figure out what the pieces are going to be. The principal is 5,000. And it grows to... 6,498. So what's that 5,000? Okay, 5,000 is going to be the principal. So that goes there, right? That's your P. What about that 6,498? Well, that is your A. And what part do we not know? If we look, we've got an A, a P, and we don't know the R. So that's going to be the missing part. So what does my formula then look like? It looks like this. 6,498 equals 5,000 times 1 plus R squared. And you can finish it from there. Okay. 
Now, question eight, I'm going to leave that one for you to do because question eight is just like one of the ones that we did in our, our examples here. Okay, it looks very, very similar to this one. Remember Tanner and Sheldon? It's the same thing. So you can do eight on your own. Now, what about nine? We only have a couple more to look at here. What about nine? Well, nine, they give you this equation, right? And they want the ball to, to fall to what? 264, isn't it? Okay. So, can anyone tell me what the equation would look like? What is my S going to be? If I read it, my S is what? Yep, 264 feet, right? So that's going to go there. So what does my equation then look like? 264 equals now 16T squared plus 32T. You can finish it from there. Now, how would you approach this one? This one probably will not factor, so I'm going to give you a hint. You're going to have to use the quadratic formula. So this one's going to require you to use the quadratic formula. You have set it at zero. You might be able to factor out a 16. I would try that. Eventually, though, it says round. Anytime it says round, it's not probably going to factor. You're going to be either using the quadratic formula or you're going to be using the square root property. Zero factor normally won't work on these. The last one. Um, I'll set up the last one. I'll just partly set it up and you can finish it. A building needs a ramp to make it handicap accessible. By law, the ramp must run 10 inches horizontally for every one inch in rise. So that means it looks like this. Okay, it's going to look like this. Here's the ramp. The surface of the ramp is 48 inches long. Now, what do we know about the height? We don't know the height, so we're going to call that x. But what do we know about the run? It says the run is 10 inches horizontally for every 1 inch of rise. So it's a, a 10 to 1 ratio. So if this is x, then this one will be what? 10 times as much, so it would be 10x, right? We've done several of these triangles, so I think you can finish it from here. This is your C, this is your A, and this is your B. So I'll go ahead now and pass out the sign-in sheet. Now, what did we cover for our homework? Our homework was what? Was 1.5, right? Try to work them out. We can go over some more of them next time. This is sign in sheet. So make sure that you sign the sign in sheet. Graded homework is over there. So we've got, if you turned in homework from last time and took your exam, it's all over there. Oh, yep, if you have homework.